buddy. Turning towards me. <laughs> There we are. You know, these, these, uh, these are like a mirror image of the signs. So the signs just don't come in. Pain. We are live. This is uh, Dr. Mark Gibson with Conspiracies Against Wellness and uh, representing uh, Janelle Elgaway and her website. Thank you for sharing this uh, with us today, Janelle. And uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, there's the, there's the lens. So uh, we are we are here to rally, um, and we're rallying against what? What are we rallying against, you guys? Pain. Pain. Punishment of pain. Punishment of pain. Okay. Suffering. Treating patients like criminals. We got Hippocrates here. He wants us yes, not, not to do any harm. So that's him over there. Do no harm, says Hippocrates. And then we have shoes. We have shoes representing and formerly owned by some of our pain patients who are no longer with us. Um, so, welcome. Welcome to our rally. We have intrepid souls here rallying, and we even have an intrepid camera person behind us. So, um, this sign says, stop calling it an opioid crisis, an illicit fentanyl heroin crisis. This sign says, pain management should save lives, not cause suicide. This sign says, Stop treating law-abiding pain patients like criminals. Don't punish pain patients. Over here, what would Hippocrates do? And of course, my favorite pain is an epic terrorist. Pain is coming for you. Came for all these people with these shoes. And no more drug war. And don't punish, punish pain. Run. Sorry. Okay, everybody. Now. Um, if I were Hippocrates, what I would be what I'd be asking is, why are you people causing so much pain to your brothers and sisters in this country? Why do you think that's happening? Control. Pure and simple, it's control. They want mm -hmm. control of everything, and controlling the doctors is a big step in controlling people. Well, how do they control doctors? It's very easy. They make regulations where the doctor has no choice but to abide by those those regulations yeah. or lose his Thank business you, and be unable to help anybody in any way, shape, or form. Or go to prison. Or go to prison. And lose all his assets. Um, so yeah, that is a difficult situation. You guys are welcome to walk right through. Be safe. Yeah. Um, so as a doctor, I can tell you that uh, there's three ways you can terrorize a doctor. Um, one is to threaten his license. And I had a six year battle over my medical license. The next way is to uh, threaten them with jail or prison. Um, so the techniques that the DEA uses is they come in, they raid a doctor's clinic, they, cut, they take all the headlines and say this doctor is running a pill mill. Then they say uh, they seize the doctor's records so none of the doctor's patients can get any medications or find anyone to treat them. And then after a lot of headlines in a couple of years, then they've contaminated the jury pool, the doctor pretty much feels like he has to take a plea because he doesn't want to spend 40 years in prison. So he takes a plea, he loses his license, loses his career, loses his reputation. Some blow their brains out like that. That's how that goes. The third way to terrorize a doctor is to claim insurance fraud, which is very difficult to disprove. Mistakes are make, made. Um, an insurance fraud claim happened against me and um, it was difficult to fight. They claimed that Somebody I had seen was seen by another person and somebody someone else was seen was billed under me We used to see 11,000 patients a year at our clinic So you can imagine that maybe a hundred of them were misfiled with insurance So I had to battle that so and that takes a lot of administrative time <coughs> And proof that you didn't do what they said you had to do so all three of those doctors find themselves in the position of having to prove that they are innocent so they're guilty until proven innocent, and that's not the way our legal system is. not fair. No. Operate. That's a major move of the government right yeah. now. You are guilty until you're proven innocent. Yeah. Yeah. Ask Kavanaugh. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, who else here has an experience of chronic pain? Yes. Um, I'm a medical cannabis provider here in Montana, um, under 10 patients, not a lot to take care of. But basically, I have patients that have gotten lower doses of their opioids because of cannabis use. 
um, but they can't quit the opioids completely as much as we'd like them to and as much as they'd like to and treating them like criminals and like addicts isn't fair and there's a lack of education and rampant fear behind what they're calling the opioid crisis. Um, they need to strike a balance, I understand that, but people need to stop being treated like garbage just because they have chronic pain. Yes, well said, well said. And you, my dear, you are? I'm Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, and I do have chronic pain from cancer. I have neuropathy, fibromyalgia. Uh, unlike some other people, I am being treated very well by my doctor, Good. but I am here to support the people that are not. And uh, also, if you go to the emergency room, you're all treated as a junkie. Yeah. yeah. And, and I apologize for that. As a retired emergency room physician, I yes. want to, from the bottom of my heart, apologize to you and everyone else who's treated terribly. Come to the ER. They're not here because they're happy. They're not. They're not coming to the ER to make your day worse. They're yes. coming to the ER because they're miserable right. and they want some relief. Right. And we have now made it a crime, practically, to come to the emergency room. Right. And I believe that we need to be treated each as an individual, and not as a person they might have saw two hours ago that just came off the street. So yeah. Yeah. that's that's. And guess what? The thing. person who came off the street. They're people too. And they're people too. Right. Everybody needs to be treated well. Everybody needs to be Did treated well. Did Jesus discriminate whose feet he was washing? No. 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 And compassion is what's missing these days. Yep. I'd like to go with another thing that you just said. You had cancer and you had tr and you were treated for it. And part of the treatment for it has left you in chronic pain. Absolutely. So what the f right. are we doing? Um, so we're going to save your life and insist that you be grateful that we've saved your life. But we're not going to give a shit about the life we've saved. Absolutely. And the chemo is what caused my neuropathy of and course. severe pain. Of course. It's very difficult to deal with that kind of pain, particularly yeah. when you thought you were dodging a bullet. Absolutely. And actually you were... Getting another wounded. bullet. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's not a complaint against conventional medicine. We do great things. We can put your liver back together if you're ejected from your car. We can do great things in yes. trauma and cardiac care. We just suck at the long-term care stuff. Yeah. And, um, and we have invented a world-class pain management system in our country, the envy of all the world, and now we're destroying it. And destroying we're taking it from the Renaissance yep. to the Dark Ages. Absolutely. Rhonda, tell me about yourself. Well, um, I am a chronic pain patient for the past 11 years. I've had several surgeries. I'm facing two more surgeries, and I'd like to see more compassion and uh, long-term care for chronic pain patients. What's the difference between having your pain treated and having your pain not treated? It's hell, <laughs> complete livid hell. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, I really wouldn't. And how do you measure pain management in somebody if pain is subjective? You know, you, you say your pain's 10 out of 10, I might not believe it. How do I know that your pain is horrible? That. That is hard. That is hard for a physician, and um, I believe that um, you know physicians are scared. Yeah. They are. They're scared, and um, if you have the records, if you have you know years of medical records, then um, I think patients should be treated for the pain that they're in. Oh, as if their re medical records might actually be accurate. Well, true. Yeah, yeah. and. and the, the, que the question I have also, though, is for one way to measure how people are doing with their pain is how are they functioning? Are they working? Are they getting on the ground with their grandparents, grandkids and playing? Are they able to eat? Um, what do their loved ones say? If you go, if you go by yourself to a, to a doctor's appointment, you don't have any corroboration of your story. No. Nope. But what if your loved ones say, oh, well, you know, she hasn't yeah. walked around the block. I saw a veteran who was cut off from these medicines second time out of his house was to come and see me um, in a year and and you know what his favorite thing to do was read books do you know what medicines he was on gabapentin oh, that's stop worse. reading he can't even read he can yeah. just watch the television and sit in his bark around yep. Yep. that is a horrible thing out. to do to somebody yep. why would we think that why, why would we think that people in pain it's their fault many patients in pain have had surgeries how many do you have uh, I've had four surgeries. I'm facing a second shoulder surgery and a back surgery. Right. And once they start on your back, they're not stopping, are they? No, because I've yeah. had two cervical fusions. Right. Talk about a pain in the neck, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Whew. 
Danielle, tell me about your, your friend um, oh, that you knew somewhere that had something. Um, are they still getting their pain treated? Um, they are, but when they run out of pain medication, they have to be hospitalized because there's um, pharmacies are not allowed to carry the amount of medications that they need to. Yeah. And they live in such a small community that when they run out, they're out. And that means that she has to be hospitalized. So and she's been dealing with chronic pain ever since she was a child. We're talking kindergarten, and I know that she's in her mid-30s now. Yeah, wow. So 25 years of chronic pain. Mm -hmm. How long can people last with that kind of pain? I don't know. She doesn't give up, and I commend her for that. Yeah, yeah. That's just heroic, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, climbing Everest might be heroic, but getting up out of bed for 25 years and not having any relief, that's what heroism is, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you bring up another great point about how expensive is it to take care of chronic pain? Well, it's pretty expensive when you run out of pain medicines three weeks into the month and you're in the hospital the other week. And you're using them correctly as they are prescribed. As they are yeah. prescribed, right? Yeah. So somebody's not doing the math here. Well, here's some math for you. 100 million people in pain in America. Now, does 100 million people need opiates? No. 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 My, le my level of pain today is a three. So, do I need a pain pill? No. I'm, I'm freezing my ass off, and that's going to help <laughs> because I, my ass got too big. But, but at some point, you know, if you're at a level of three, you might even be able to meditate. But I tell you what, if there's a, if there's a snowstorm out here, it's 13 degrees here today. If there was a snowstorm and wind blowing, we would not be standing here. No. Yeah. And you sure as, hell would, sure as hell wouldn't be able to meditate. No. Okay, so any idea that you can do mind over matter it might work up to a level of four, or maybe even five. When you get a pain level above seven, it is gnawing and boring yeah. into you like nothing you've ever experienced. It's like hunger, it's like thirst. It's like labor and having to push a baby out. It is, it is unresistible, irresistible. And you cannot fight it, you cannot concentrate, you cannot work, and you cannot love your loved ones at those levels of pain. And we're not talking about pain free here. We're talking about people getting so that they can get up. Function. function have a, function, have a some sort make of Make a, a sandwich life. for Contribute. their kids in the morning. Exactly. Yeah. Be a mother. How, do, how can you be a mother if um, all you have is lack of concentration, you can't read a book to your kids, you can't get out of bed, and you, and you feel, what is that emotion that we feel when we're stuck in bed and can't contribute in any way? We're Depression. Just, yes. Well, undertreated pain is, is terrible. It's undertreated shame, isn't pain it? yeah. has also caused, um, I have high blood pressure, and it's completely yeah. because of untreated or undertreated pain. Right, right. And then there's, how can you reverse um, un unmanageable blood pressure from undertreated pain? Well, an opiate might help. Cannabis might help. And, and, but if you're on seven blood pressure medicines and you're not getting your pain treated, your pain's not going to get better. No, get it's better. not. And it's going to deplete your adrenal glands. And this, this raises another question. What do people in pain die of? Adrenal failure? Yes, they die of pain. They don't die of an opiate problem. So a lot of people in pain have sudden death. They go to an autopsy. Somebody measures their uh, opiate. Uh, opiate, and it's an opiate-related <laughs> death. Exactly. <laughs> and that it's like yes. we don't measure we don't measure a tenolol in hypertensive patients and call it an tenolol-related death. If your cardiologist loses you on the table while they're trying to save your life, did the cardiologist kill him? I don't think so. I mean, I think that, that we have to begin to really look at what's causing these deaths. Most of the opiate-related deaths, what are they from? Heroin. And why is heroin abundant and cheap? Because people aren't getting their pain medications like they need to, and so they have to go to the black market now right. in order to achieve relief and not be and, sick. And, and, and so, so, so many people are going people to the black market. Yet. Oh, I know a ton of people. It mm -hmm. makes me sad. Childhood friends. Yeah. But opiates, yeah. I also believe opiates is something that the government can control. They can't control heroin. They can't control meth. But they can control opiates. Right. And so and what so, do they try to control? Opiates. And where... Uh-oh, I'm getting a ticket. Um, um, <coughs> you want to move my car for me? Yeah, it's running. Is that um, your car? Yeah. yeah, I had to move it because of uh, legislators in the spot. So, um, so, okay, so um, heroin. 
So where is all the poppies grown? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. <laughs> What's happened to poppy production in the last 15 years in Afghanistan? Skyrocketed. It was zero in 2001, right? We were carpet bombing. And ever since then, it's done nothing but increase. And um, uh, and now they've, they've exceeded previous production quotas every year that, that they measure. So, gone up like that. Well, opiate prescriptions in America went up like that. And people think that they're related. Yep. It's just a coincidence. It's, a, it's not causal. The heroin production and poppy production in Afghanistan might be causative. And I'm wondering why we're not talking <coughs> about that. Yeah, and I, I, I would ask people, you know, if, if you have uh, asthma, you want to be treated for it, don't you? Yeah. If you have, uh, you know, diabetes, you want to be treated for it. Well, here's a good question. If you have an asthma attack and you're using your albuterol, and you're using it a little extra because you can't breathe and you die, is that an albuterol overdose? They probably would They would say so. Though. I sure hope not because that's what I use. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, do, I do too. Right. I do too. Or, or, or what, if you're, what if you're insulin dependent diabetic and you take too much of your insulin, your blood sugar goes down. That's a complication of insulin. Should we take insulin off the market? Well, we practically are because it's so frigging expensive nowadays. But, but yeah. essentially, what we're saying is this is, this is leaking out just from the pain patients into the rest of the population. Your doctor doesn't get to decide what's right for you based on a cooperative agreement and a consultation with you as a patient. Someone else is deciding. Who else is deciding? Insurance companies, legislators, regulators, pharmacists are deciding not to fill prescriptions that they feel might be inappropriate. Not with even a phone call. Oh, oh, I'm not comfortable. Yeah. That is the pharmacist mantra, right? Yeah. I'm not comfortable with this medication refill. Well, would you look at my history and see that I've taken this medication for 15 years and still alive? Oh, you're too much risk for an overdose and death. Show me the numbers. Where is the evidence? Where is the evidence that a chronic pain patient is going to divert their pain pills? They're going to have to buy them back at three times the price, right? <laughs> and so you're not going to sell your pills. Um, and, and if you were to buy your pills on the street these days, what are you going to get? Counterfeit pills. And what do they have in them? Fentanyl. 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 You know, how many, how many stories do you hear repeatedly of some kid who took a pill and died? I know somebody who took a not opioid related drug and died from fentanyl overdose. Right, so it was a counterfeit How's it going? Xanax or something. I'm sorry. A counterfeit oh. something else. <laughs> yep. so, no, no you're worries. fine. You're good. You're gonna, we're going to interview here in a second. <laughs> you're back. Go to a meeting right now. <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you take someone else's pill and you don't know what's in it. That's why we regulate them. That's why we get pills at pharmacies. So that, so that we have a certain amount of trust in the products that are manufactured in our country that they are what they say they're going to be. And if they're not, all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. Well, all hell is breaking loose because it's people are buying pills yes. on a black market that is going to supply something to somebody that wants them. It's going to fulfill demand. The demand for those pills has skyrocketed. Yep. And who do you want managing your pain? Your doctor? Your doctor. Or Go Sam yeah. down there in the My corner? Doctor. You know? Some guy on a cash basis. I want and, them uh, no to... community safe. Doesn't matter how big or how small. No community is safe. They need no. to get out of the doctor's office. Get the who out of the doctor's office? Get the government, get the DEA, the CDC, get them out of my doctor's office. Yep. Yeah, what happened with the CDC? It went crazy. Hands. Yeah. Did the CDC ever manage pain? No. Not until 2016. CDC's job is to manage infectious diseases and keep us safe from Ebola, tuberculosis, meningitis, pneumococcal pneumonia, etc. The FDA has been the one to manage pain. Well, what happened to the pain management in this country? Treat us all, treat us all like jerseys. Yeah, well, how, how did it get started? I mean, this is a great question by a few bad apples out there yes. that were being, in my opinion, rewarded to over-prescribe, but in only in a minute amount of communities, honestly, yeah. if you look at the statistics. So let's talk about welfare and, and how many people scam the welfare system. A lot. <laughs> a lot. No, it turns out to be 3%. Really? Really? 3% yep. of people get welfare illegally. 
Well, yeah. and and then we do drug testing on welfare people. That costs us two million dollars. <laughs> yes. so. and, and we spent yeah. two million dollars to save fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> and the same and thing happens with do. pain patients. I mean, you can tell who's lying. Yeah. Well, maybe not on the first visit, but you might be able to, uh, you know, do an interview or find out on weird behaviors if somebody's maybe at risk. Um, but what happens is patients get cut off with one strike. It's one strike and you're out. And some of the drug tests that are done are 30% false positives and false negatives. Many of the patients I saw were fired from their doctor under those circumstances. They had a pinky urine and their doctor says, we're done with you yep. after, after once. And which means that person's in acute withdrawal and yep. they're coming in my door, yep. sweating, uh, sick. shaking, in vomiting, in pain, in withdrawal, just because their doctor got terrified of a pinky urine. Well, you had a heart. Well, yeah. I but, heard you had a heart. Never saw you. Yeah. But I heard you had a heart. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm old school. I mean, I signed a Hippocratic Oath, and I, I think that, that yes. Hippocrates said, do no harm. Yes. And the problem with do no harm is it lets everybody off the hook if they don't do anything. Yeah. And not doing something is harm in this particular situation, yeah. I think. And, and, and so... And they just don't care. That, I and mean, that's how I feel. And, and the doctors become so cold, not all of them, but they're so worried about losing, and they've even said it to, like, even my husband, that, uh, you know, so my license, I'm not going to lose my license for you. Yeah, well, I can't help you if I'm in prison. I mean, I learned that after seven years of battling, <laughs> yep. and, and I knew that they had their foot on my neck, and if I got up again, They'd be sending me. They'd be sending more investigators and, and making up more stories. So I know you got this idea, this narrative, saying that there are all these bad doctors that run pill mills. Well, um, what do you got as a doctor? As a tool, you got a prescription pad yep. and a knife. There's only two things you got, and a couple of ears to listen. But if you don't listen, you're not going to know whether to use the prescription pad or the knife. Right. But you know, it, it, are you a drug seeker? If you, if you come in to see me and you want a particular medication that you've been on, well, you I know, I'm a, I go to a restaurant, I'm a calorie seeker. You know, I go to a bar, I'm a beer seeker. It's like, but of you, course, you as, as a human being, you get to go and shop. I go to a gas station, I'm a gas seeker. But you can't go to a doctor and say, well, hydros worked for me where this didn't work for me. Red flag. Red flag. Because and that's you, true. You, Red flag. you said the word hydro, because you've used it before, know it worked for you because you had a surgery, right? Or whatever. But you know it. what's funny is if you don't want it because I'm lightweight and I can't handle it. Right. Every doctor, Once you have a problem, you. you have knee surgery. He's like, I'm sending you home with this prescription for hydrocodone. Yeah. yeah. I said I'll be fine. I'll take my Advil. Right. So and he was like, No, no, I want you to. And I never took it. He asked me, Did you? No. So there's a reason that people don't tolerate these medicines and take and, right. and, and, and have high side effects. We know our Those bodies. people are slow metabolizers. If they're a slow metabolizer of opiates, you're going to throw up, you're going to have constipation, yep. you're going to get not much pain relief, and you're going to say, I don't like those. They make me feel worse than having the pain. That's a slow metabolizer. And a rapid, fast metabolizer. rapid metabolizers, completely it's gone. Different. It's out of your no system. No side effects. Go through your system instantly. Hardly ever withdraw because. The system, it's out of your system so, so fast. fast. A pill that's last that's supposed to last 12 hours lasts seven. That's me. Um, and so, yeah. and, and, and everybody says, well, you must be a criminal if you're taking high doses. We don't say that in any other illness. We don't say that in diabetes. You need 70 units of insulin and you need 10. And you must be bad. No insulin for you. Yeah. Like, that is exactly. crazy. If your blood pressure is high, we're going to give you four blood pressure medicines and keep treating your blood pressure. Right because we know if it's out of control, it's gonna be harmful to you. You have a stroke and, th and then I'm in trouble because I missed that, I didn't treat it appropriately. And it's sad because with the severe pain that I have, my doctor, and I won't say name, he would have upped me. Yes. But he said, but I can't. Right. But I can't. Because he doesn't want to get in trouble. Well, yes. it's an there's law, it? there's right. yep. It's a fear. It's false evidence appearing real. So in my case, I can't say that anymore because I think there is evidence that your doctor will be locked up or go away. Uh, you're right. And not only that, yeah. you, you've got a doctor who's treating your pain and that is so great. But you are one car crash away from losing that. You and, know it. And, and, and I fear it every day. And, and you know, he goes away or something happens. Uh-huh. And does his partner treat your pain? Uh-uh. Oh, no way. Could be different. Doesn't matter if he trusted you. It's a trust thing between a patient and a doctor is a thing that evolves over time. And, yep. and so your next doctor won't treat that. I know, and that's what scares me. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you manage that? What's your plan 
this is sort of like making, a, you know, buying life insurance. You know, what's your plan for losing access? I mean, most people are struggling; they've already lost their access. But it seems to me, if you're if you're operating in this system of scarcity, you're going to hoard. Okay, you're going to oh, put absolutely. stuff away. You're going to you're going to you're going to have yep. a week's supply, a two week supply, yep. that sort of thing. And people are saying, well, that's, you know, that's you're not checking your medicines as prescribed. Well, they are as needed. Yep. And if you don't need them, you can park them right. and keep them under lock and key. Yep. And use something else for your But family. a week still isn't nothing. Right? A week is a nothing. Week is nothing. This gives you another week of what? To worry about it again and again yeah. and again and again. Yeah. yeah. That's why planes are nothing terrorists. Because did you notice ever you see movies or even interviews on, on the radio, people are being terrorized, you're chained to a wall, and they're torturing you, right? So they go take a cigarette break. Is your terror over? Hell no, you know they're coming back. You know they're coming back. So, so the terror is this anticipation, this concern Absolutely. that I'm gonna be treated terribly at one point because everyone yep. else has been, even if you're lucky enough to be treated appropriately. Yep. Okay.